Thank you. Let's just open in prayer and then we'll just dive into what the Lord has for us this morning. Father, we know that you are a God of all wisdom and you are a God of truth. You're a God who has never compromised and never will compromise. You are always truth and always will be truth. But you are also a God of great mercy. And you speak to your people from the mercy seat, not from a judgment seat. And we thank you, Lord, that your mercy has been extended to each and every one of us. And we embrace that mercy this morning, Lord, as we, as we just discuss a, a very sobering topic this morning. And so, Lord, I just pray for you to comfort your people, to, to stabilize your people, and to make us strong in your love, in your mercy, in your grace, in your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. In this last uh, few days, something has um, opened up to the body. It's just been made um, public on one level of it. Anyways, this morning, about half an hour or so ago, was made public, a public statement has come forward um, to begin a process. But I'm not going to mention any names at all or any ministry names this morning, but someone who is a, a, a very strategic general in the body of Christ, a father of faith, um, has uh, been um, exposed for, for some severe transgression. And this is being looked at. He has denied it to this point, but there's a lot of uh, people who have come forward uh, to validate their concerns and their testimony. And so it's a time when we need to really pray on a number of, a number of levels because when something like this happens, there's such a, a sense of betrayal in the body. Um, there's fears, there's insecurities. It would be like if you had a father in your home who you trusted and loved and honored and all of a sudden found out that they hurt you and transgressed their values. It would just shatter you. And this is potentially what happens in the body of Christ when fathers and mothers fall. And it's a very severe thing. We don't take it lightly. But as a leadership of this house, we want to help you know where to stand and how to process this. And pastorally, it's, it's really important that we have this talk. We didn't want to leave you to just find out the information and not know what to do with it or not know how to process it. Because we want this um, to bring us through in greater strength in the Lord, not weaker, but stronger and more stabilized in him than ever before. But I want to uh, read a scripture that was highlighted to me in worship this morning. It's out of Malachi 2, and it is addressing the priesthood. And all of us are priests. Um, I don't want us to point our finger at anyone with any kind of accusation right now. This whole thing is sobering. In fact, I'm extremely broken over it. Um, but as... As sobering as it is, we are all, we all stand before God. And we might not all be in a position where we have influence over others in the same way that um, this particular uh, man of God does. But you all have influence over someone. And our hearts are to be before the Lord. And we are all we are all priests before God. And we all need to stand accountable but God is addressing the priests here, um, saying that he was going to curse the priests because of their lack of honor. And um, he says in uh, verse 5, my covenant was with Levi, uh, which was the order of the priesthood. My covenant was with the priesthood, we could say, a covenant of life and peace. And I gave them to him. Um, this called for reverence and he revered me and stood in awe of my name true instruction was in his mouth and nothing false was found on his lips he walked with me in peace and uprightness and turned many from sin for the lips of a priest ought to preserve knowledge because he is the messenger of the lord almighty and people seek instruction from his mouth but you have turned from the way and by your teaching have caused many to stumble. You have violated the covenant with Levi, says the Lord Almighty. 
So I have caused you to be despised and humiliated before all people because you have not followed my ways, but have shown partiality in matters of the law. And the reason I'm bringing that up, that scripture up, is because I want us to begin um, with a sobriety um, that is extremely important in this hour. Um, walking with the Lord demands um, a stand of righteousness and truth, and it's not to be taken lightly. And we believe in the unconditional love of the Lord. We believe in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. We depend on his mercy. All of that are great values within this house. But at the same time, we need to understand that there's a sober call to live in humility, uprightness, and truth before the Lord. And when I was um, delivering words of the Lord that he had given me for this year, for 5784, in the part two of it, I uh, proclaimed, and this is written in the um, uh, notes actually, spirits of Jezebel, Baal, and other demonic forces whose assignment are sexual perversion and exploitation will be exposed and aggressively confronted in this next five to 10 years. Whistleblowers will be raised up to expose what is now hidden. And so this is, this is that. The comfort that we can receive in that is to realize that God knows all about it ahead of time. And he's not moved. He is not moved by our failures or anyone else's failures. He is still God. He doesn't change. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He knows everything that's going on. He is not only the one who exposes, but he is the solution as well. And for every exposure, there is a solution. And that's what we want to look to today. But I also wanted to read... Um, an excerpt from chapter four out of my book prophetic manifesto for a new era um it's out of uh was written in 2019 but it says an, an era of exposure and this was the era that began at rosh hashanah in 2019 we marked a new era and uh, the scripture, there's two scriptures that were key on this chapter. One of them was Ephesians 5, 11 and 13. It says, do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead even expose them. But all things become visible when they are exposed by the light. For everything that becomes visible is light. And also in Luke uh, 12, 2 and 3. This is out of the Passion Translation. It says, everything hidden will soon be exposed for the facade is falling down and nothing will be kept secret for long. Whatever you have spoken in private will be public knowledge and what you have whispered secretly behind closed doors will be broadcast far and wide for all to hear. I just want to say that this is not just for a leader with a lot of influence. This is for all of us. Okay, so I want us to all understand this, that we are all in the same boat of humanity here, and we are all subject to the same uh, Lord who created us. But I want to read um, a part of the prophetic word out of Prophetic Manifesto, and it might be a book worth getting, um, and just studying out the prophetic words and praying into them and aligning your own heart with those words. But um, this is what the Lord spoke. He said, I am light, says the Lord, and in me there is no darkness at all. I will shine my light into the darkness of men's hearts and ways and expose things that have not been seen or noticed by others. Shock waves will hit my body as deeds of darkness become exposed. I have watched my people fall into diverse temptations, even though I was there to beckon them to turn away. After they partook of the temptation, I reached out by knocking with conviction on the door of their heart over and over. When they continued to ignore my conviction and invitation to repent, I sent others to give warning and to call them back into alignment with me and my truth. But they failed to listen. They failed to repent. So I again persisted by sending even others, but still to no avail. It is now time to openly expose. Some have been 
engaged in deeds of darkness behind closed doors for many years. But even as I took my servant Ezekiel into the inner part of the temple and revealed to him the abominations that were taking place in secret, so also in this hour will I make these things known. My heart is to love and to heal. Do you not know that whatever a man sows, he will also reap? Do you not know that if you sow to the flesh, you will reap corruption? I love my people and I love all whom I have created but I must rescue, I must deliver. I have given time to repent, but those who have hardened their hearts have refused to turn away from the deeds of darkness. I have called, but many have not listened. They have ignored my beckoning call. The darkness is spreading and infecting others around them like a virus, and it must be stopped. My people must be clean and free, therefore I must act. Many will say, why does this need to be exposed? I will answer, because this is love. Due to the exposure, many will be tempted to lose trust, and some individuals will even lose their faith. This is an hour to walk closely with me, for I never compromise what is right, and I never change. I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. I always walk in integrity, love, truth, and wisdom. Even when men and women shall fail you, I will not fail you. Draw close to me in this hour and trust me. Without exposure, healing cannot come. Without exposure, cleansing cannot come. Without exposure, alignment cannot come. Without exposure, solutions cannot come. It is time my house shall be cleansed. Even as I cleanse my house by exposing and overturning the money changers' tables, so also I shall I cleanse my house in this hour. I will shine my light and expose the deeds of darkness so that true freedom and kingdom life will be made manifest. So we are in a season of exposure, and the one that you're going to hear about later today, if you haven't heard about it already, is only one, and there will be others. And it's not, the issue is not of who's going to be exposed or what's going on. It's how we respond. How are you going to respond when you hear about the failures of human beings, about the failures of great men and women of faith who have, who have supposedly led the way and forged trails for others, and then all of a sudden you see them falter and fail. How are you going to respond? And that's what we want to address in our house. We want to set a uh, standard in this house so that we can be kept safe as we walk through this, so that we can be kept close to the heart of God as we process these failures. Because this is not the last one we'll hear about. It's not the first one. It won't be the last one. But how we handle it is going to make the difference. How we walk through it is the key issue right now. So I just want to quickly this morning give you some places to stand. And the first one is, is please keep your faith in God strong. Keep your faith in God strong. When men fail you, realize it's just like the frailty, the frailty of human beings is, is, is just out there for all of us. But look to God and keep your faith in him strong no matter what. And it's hard. When you see respected and honored leaders, it is hard. I'm not saying it's not hard. I find it hard myself. I find it soul crushing to hear what has happened. It is not an easy thing, but it cannot cause us to lose our faith in God because he is bigger than anyone's failure and he has a solution for it all and the latter glory of the house will be greater than the former. He will find a way for his blood to cleanse, his word to sanctify and for him to strengthen the body and bring about his purposes. We just have to determine whose team we're going to be with and we're going to be with, with team Jesus. Amen. Do not waver and play into the hands of the enemy's agenda. 
In Ephesians 6, 10 to 12, it says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. And we need to understand that none of us are exempt from attack. That's why we need each other. That's why we need to be in the house of God. That's why we need to be family together because no one is exempt. We might not have the same attack as someone else. We might not be open to a temptation that someone else will be suffering, but all of us can be attacked. And that's why we need to be strong in the Lord and strong with one another and realize that there is a very real enemy out there. Jesus said, the thief comes. He comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But he said that I came, that you would have life in its abundance. And Jesus said, the prince of this world is coming, but he has nothing in me. There's nothing in common. I just want to say, take time to minister to your soul. Invest in the health of your own soul and the alignment of your life. And honestly, go get some Masha ministry regularly. You know, because life happens. Life happens and the dust can settle. And it's worth the investment. A lot of times we'll make an investment into, you know, a hamburger or something, but we don't invest into our own soul. And it's really important that we value that. I just want to encourage you, encourage you to do that because the enemy is prowling and we're not to fear him. We're to have full confidence that we can walk with God safely through our life. Um, But it is going to take an alertness and a drawing close to God. Secondly, examine your own heart and life and don't judge others. It's very easy when you've been hurt by someone to judge them. How could they do that? How could they, with all that God gave them, how could they do that? How could they hurt the body of Christ? How could they crush the souls of so many? It's easy to go there, isn't it? We see it all over social media already. It's already out there. But we are not of that spirit. We're not going to judge. We're not going to condemn. We're going to cry mercy. Why? Because we need to cry mercy for ourselves. I don't know about you, but I need mercy. You know, we all need it. And if I don't extend it to someone else, how can I receive it for myself? God's going to deal with the transgressors. He has his way, but that's for him to do. We are to judge others' behaviors like we could judge a behavior as being ungodly, but we can't judge a person's heart. Condemnation is such a final judgment of the heart, and we don't have the right, the authority, or the power to condemn anyone. Only God has the perfect slate and is the author of the standard that can bring final judgment or salvation. I always say, if you can't save, you can't judge. Jesus is the one who could save, and therefore he's the only one who can judge. 1 Corinthians 11 31, it says, but if we judge ourselves rightly, we would not be judged. So let's just look at our own hearts. 1 Corinthians 9, 27, out of the Passion Translation, it says, I subdue my body and get it under my control so that after preaching the good news to others, I myself won't be disqualified. Matthew 7, verses 1 to 5, do not judge so that you will not be judged, for in the way that you judge, you will be judged. And by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye and look, the log is in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. I find that when I look at my own issues, when I ask the Lord to examine my own heart, it's easy, easy, easy to have mercy for others. Amen. 
And we might not be doing the same thing as someone else, but you can't say, I just don't get how they could ever do that. I would never do that. You don't know that you would never do it because you're not under the same warfare as them. You're not under the same situations as they live in. And we aren't called to judge that. And we're not called to walk in a pride that says, I will never do it because you'd be surprised what you can do when evil hits your soul. And so as long as we stay in the mercy of God and cry mercy, that mercy will cover others as well as ourself. When man fails, God will bring justice, truth, and alignment. He will. We have to trust him for that. But we're to desire mercy for all. I just want to say, you know, it's the little fox that destroy the vine. And I was talking to a... Um, you know, a spiritual leader last night over this whole situation. And they have in their church working alongside of them, they have a, uh, a psychologist, a Christian psychologist who has worked actually with many uh, different leaders who have fallen into sin over the years. And they said, this is how the dynamic works. And I want you to get this because we can all use this insight. He said that what happens is the enemy comes with a temptation. And we can all be tempted in whatever, right? The enemy comes with a temptation. And if you do not hear the conviction of the spirit that comes at the same time as the temptation, and you choose the temptation instead of the conviction, what happens is you've just denied the Lord and accepted the devil. So that behavior then takes root in your life and you cover it. That's right out of Genesis. You start covering your transgression. You hide it. And then it comes again. You might even say, I'll never do that again. But you're covering it. You're not bringing it into accountability. You're not telling anyone about it to get some prayer or some help. And you just cover it up. And then it comes again. And if you deny the conviction of the spirit again and fall into the temptation again, then the same cycle begins again and again and again, over and over again. But that temptation will continue to knock on your door. And every time it'll get uh, uh, your your ability to overcome will get weaker and weaker and weaker because you're you're trading your strength for the weakness that the devil's offering you, and eventually, a demon will conquer your heart, and then you're in the deceitfulness of sin that Hebrews talks about, where you um, are taken over by an evil power and you you get really good at hiding the sin and covering things up and your thinking and everything gets very deceptive and it can go on for years and years without being detected by others around you. Why? Because the devil is that smart. He's stupid, but he knows how to sin real good. So we want to make sure that when the Holy Spirit's convicting us on anything, that we heed the conviction right away and don't let all that, you know, little bits take us down. Number three, receive healing. Acknowledge your pain and disappointment. When I heard this yesterday, I'll just be open and vulnerable. I was undone. I was crushed by it. I was shocked. I did not expect it. I... I love this person very much. I honor and respect this person very much. And I was absolutely crushed by it. And I could feel the pain in my heart, in fact, so huge. I, I, I thought I was going to vomit. And, um, and I carried the brokenness all day. And I thought, I just have to acknowledge that I'm hurt really bad over this. Because if you don't acknowledge your hurt, you'll start responding out of it rather than receiving what you need for healing. And it's really important. Don't just react out of your hurt, but get the healing that you need. I had to soak in the Lord and say, Lord, I just need to, I need to be healed. And I still do. I'm hurting for the man of God involved, his family, those that have worked with him and been faithful to him for years, the masses that are in the nations that have been under his ministry all these years all the organizations that have worked. I mean, it's just a whole pile of pain. 
And then how do you reconcile it all? How do you help people walk through it all so that we don't react in a way that fuels the enemy's agenda rather than strengthen God's? It's huge. So if you're in pain, get the healing you need. Make an appointment with Mashar. Get some prayer. Acknowledge it. Soak in the Lord. That's what I had to do last night, all night long, soaking in the Lord, saying, Lord, I just need your healing. I'm disillusioned. I'm broken right now. And the Lord will bind you up. The Lord will heal you because he is faithful. He is faithful. So acknowledge your pain and your disappointment and process with those who are mature and who can help you draw close to the Lord in the situation. Um, if you join together with other people that are upset and angry and hurt and, you know, you can't, you can't heal each other. Someone's got to be strong enough to help you through to the other side. And we have a great pastoral team here in the church who can help you. Number four is act and do not react. It's a book of acts. It's not the book of react. Don't retreat. Don't retreat. Don't engage in bitterness or, or ridicule or cynical attitudes or things like that. It's easy to react in those ways. But love, it, it just treats situations like this differently. And God will show you how to walk in love through this if you act in him, if you act in wisdom, if you act in love, if you act, act in his care, if you lay hold of his mercy. Don't become skeptical or dishonoring of others um, out of a reaction because bitterness is not a safe harbor. Judgment is not a safe harbor. And then finally, I'm just going to do one more and then I'll pray with you and then Robert will come up and wrap this for us. But raise the bar. Raise the bar. You know, when you see this sort of thing happening, you, you just, you know, the enemy wants to put a gag order on you and say, what do you have to say? Look at your whole generation is so evil and fallen and leading people astray, and he comes at you like that. But what's really neat is, no, I need to raise the bar higher. I need to raise the bar in this hour with an uncompromised devotion unto the Lord. We can't retreat back. We have to rise rise up in this hour. So we can raise the bar through our own life. We can be blameless in the love of God, blameless in his mercy, blameless in character. We've always said in this house we value character. We value gifting too, but I tell you, if you don't have good character, there's nothing to support your gifting. Be blameless in your faith. In Hebrews 12, 13, out of the living uh, translation, it says, Mark out a straight path for your feet, so that those who are weak and lame will not fall, but become strong. Each and every one of you, if you raise the bar of righteousness yourself, you, you will not only raise it for the Lord, but others too. We have a whole community of people here that God wants us to love to life. He wants them brought out of darkness into the light. And you are appointed and anointed by God to do it. And as you raise the bar of his love, if you raise the bar of his truth, his righteousness, his standards, and, and hold to those standards, irregardless of what anyone else does, if you raise the bar personally, it will make a difference to the world that you live in. And then finally, Isaiah 54, verse 14, it says, In righteousness you will be established, and you will be far from oppression, for you will not fear, and from terror, for it will not come near you. It is always sad when a leader falls. It is always sobering, and it is always a very vulnerable time for the body. But we need to be strong. We need to be strong for Jesus. We need to be strong in Jesus. We need to not retreat, but to move forward because he is worthy. And he's going to look after the fallen. And you know what? He loves them. 
He loves them. He's the one who knows them through and through. He knows what was in their childhood and what broke them back there. He knows what kind of battles they've had to live. He knows what the enemy did to break them. And he will stand with with those who have fallen. And he will bring them through. And we want to have that heart. That is the heart of a savior, the savior. And we want to carry that heart. And yet without compromise. We're not excusing sin, but God is very, very patient and very, very kind and very loving. And I don't know about you, but I'm really glad to know that about him. Because if he's like that for others, he'll be like that for you, for me. And we're going to grow in love and in understanding, and we're going to lift him up high. And we're going to do our best as a house to live in so much purity that this community will be able to trust us, that the body of Christ will be able to trust the Christ in us, who is the hope of glory. This is worth laying our life down for. Jesus said, you take up your cross every day and follow me. Something the Lord's been speaking to me about lately is the danger of ego. That's yourself. As soon as you exalt yourself or want things for yourself or boast about yourself or, or get disturbed because yourself is, is, is upset, you are on your way down. And that's why the cross is so powerful because when the ego rises up, you embrace the cross and say, this is about you, Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? What, how do you want me to handle this? It is not about me. It is about you. It is about your glory, and it's only for you. And I'll lay down everything to give you glory. I'll lay down everything for you. It's not about me. It's not about my comfort. It's not about my blessings. It's not about my reputation. It's not about my name. It's not about me getting praises. It's about you, Jesus. And when we die to ourselves. When we embrace that cross, then love oozes out. That's what happened. When Jesus died on that cross, love spoke for all eternity. And that's what we want to be in this house, is a house of love. Every, every opposition to love that comes our way is an invitation to embrace love, to grow in love, and to be filled with love. Amen. Are you ready to cry mercy? Oh, Lord, we do cry mercy, Lord. We thank you that you chose the mercy seat, not the judgment seat. You chose the mercy seat, not the judgment seat, to speak to your people and to, to manifest the Shekinah glory. It was on the mercy seat. and Jesus, your cross was a mercy seat, and your throne in heaven is a mercy seat. And we depend on mercy for everyone who's involved, Lord God, for the transgressors and for the victims and for everyone. Lord, we need your mercy and we need your touch, for we are needy. Lord, we exalt you in the midst of this catastrophe, in the midst of this pain. We exalt you and lay hold of you and invite you to come and fill us afresh with love with you, in Jesus' name. War on porn. Now, this is a brand new mandate for me that the Lord gave me this summer. As I was seeking him for direction for the new year, he says, I'm putting a fresh assignment on you. I need you to war against pornography. And many of you are going to catch this anointing tonight, even as we are speaking. You are going to catch this in Jesus' name, war on porn. There needs to be a return to sexual purity. So what the Lord showed me was that this strong spirit of Jezebel and of course, spirits of, of, of Baal and the Asherah and other de de demonic forces whose assignments are sexual perversion and exploitation are going to be exposed and aggressively confronted in these next five to 10 years. We, we are going to war and we're not going to stop until we win, but we're going to take ground every single month. We're going to have trophies every single month. I also saw that whistleblowers will be raised up to expose what is now hidden in this area. 
and uh, that just needs to be exposed. God will, God will work with people and make appeal to them, and 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 call them to repentance. But if they don't repent in the timing that they have, He will expose and bring the full measure of the law down on them, and we're going to see that. There is going to be a war against child sex trafficking, and it is going to, this mandate will aggressively move forward. And many of you who don't even know you're being called to it now are going to be called to it. You know, a lot of children, especially in the inner city, because, you know, let's say their mother is a prostitute and she's out turning tricks, they leave the children alone. I know this by living on the streets and working with those who are in that um um, in that service, um, they leave their children alone and their children come at, at, at risk. They'll be wandering the streets, um, the, the houses will be washed, and these children go missing. They go missing, and guess what's happening to them? They're being sold into sex trafficking, uh, labor. Um, uh, sometimes they're killed for their um, organs. Children are at risk today, and don't think it's just over. I know that we have people in Thailand here. That's where I actually received the burden of the Lord years ago was in Thailand, and I'm eternally grateful for, for Thailand being the place where God birthed the vision. It was sad what was taking place over there, but God anointed me for this back then. And um, also in Vietnam, Cambodia, all these uh, places in the hubs in um, Southeast Asia. But you know what? It's everywhere. It is everywhere. Every nation is dealing with this. But the United States of America is the greatest user of child pornography than any other nation in the world the United States of America, and we need to deal with this. Come on. We need to we need to strip this bear. What the Lord showed me is it was the love of money that is behind the porn industry. So if you remove all the users and those that are, are running the porn industry lose all of their, their customers, there's not going to be any more porn industry. And if there's no more porn industry, there's there's going to be very few children trafficked because most of them are being trafficked for porn and especially on the Internet. OK, so we've got our job cut out for for us. And I feel I feel so committed to this. I am running with various ministries who are running in this direction I'm putting my energy into this, into this fight. We as a ministry are committed to it. And I think I shared last night, I was um, speaking to one of the ministries that we're uh, running with right now. I can't share all the details on it yet, but I will in the future. And who it is that's, you know, getting all this organized, I just can't reveal it right now. But um, they are, uh, we are going to um, go hit an area where the, pornography is running rampant on the internet where where people can buy time with a sex worker online and many of these sex workers are children they're like 14 years old 15 years old 16 years old and they set up appointments and they do things online and then eventually they might meet and, and things like that we're gonna buy time with these uh girls guys and we're not going to ask them to do anything. We don't want their services. We want to give them Jesus. And if we do a porn convention outreach, which we are going to support that, of course, we are fully um, endorsing, bringing our light into the darkness in any area. But the problem with, or, or what falls short maybe in that, even though we need to be there, is that oftentimes you only get a few minutes with a person before they go on. And porn conventions are here one time a year, there one time a year. So you might be able to reach maybe four or five in a year, but you, you, you don't get the quality time. So this is where the strategy has come from my friend, and I'm on board with it 100%. In fact, I said we're going to sow the first... Um, you know, the first team, we want to sow the time. We want to buy the time for them to have with these um, workers because we're believing for a harvest and that we can get these people out of it. So that's one, just one of the uh, strategies we have. 
I also am uh, working with Troy Brewer and what he's doing around the world with um, Andrea Asen, with uh, Nightlight in uh, Thailand. We just cheer these people on. Uh, you know, we want to, you know, just support their their efforts and um, please pray for them all because they're all doing a, a, a major job. But I know that even south of the border here in Mexico, um, the largest population of children that is used for porn is coming now through Mexico into the USA. And so we've got issues with our border. And so please keep that in your prayers uh, because one of the reasons why the borders are kept open is so that there can be this multi-billion dollar industry fed. And that's why, as I shared last night, um, the Lord, he wants to transfer. He wants us to be wealthy. Okay. He wants his people who can steward with righteousness to be the ones with the money to even shut these things down because if we can shut them down and lead them to Jesus, then all of those funding won't go towards evil anymore. It'll go towards righteousness. And this is really dear to my heart. And as I said last night, I want every one of you to prosper. In fact, that's God's heart for you. I'm not just speaking it for myself. It's God's heart for you. He wants you to prosper and be in health as your soul prospers in every respect, every aspect of your life. But he also wants wealth to come to you. That's why it says in Deuteronomy 8.18, he gives you the power to make wealth, to confirm his covenant. And so if we didn't have the money, we wouldn't be able to fund workers to go online to buy the time with those girls. But because we have access to provision in heaven, we can do that. He's got provision for the vision, right? How many believers have fear about their provision for the future, but you don't need to because God's going to pour it out on believers, those of us who are really positioned for it and ready for it. And this is one of the reasons why, because of this war on porn and children at risk and annihilating sex trafficking and organ trafficking and all that kind of stuff, we've, we've got to do a, a divine takeover. And according to Isaiah 60, it's exactly what we're going to do in the hour that we're living in. So I'm really excited. And so you can say, here I am, Lord, send me. There are... Uh, what. What the Lord uh, showed me is that many are going to be called to this ministry to be a voice against porn and to help those who are bound by it. Um, because this is a spiritual thing. There's no condemnation. There's no shame or, or blame in the Lord. He just wants us all free. So there's many, even maybe amongst you, that are going to be raised up by God to minister in this area. And so I'm really excited for you on, on that. And, um, and also um, in the area of sexual purity, a lot of more messages will be preached from the pulpits concerning the why of sexual purity, not just uh, don't commit adultery, but why you don't, right? So we're going to see more of that and maybe even some more books on it that will be written um, because there needs to be a holy... Uh, draw of the heart uh, concerning our, our sexuality and uh, repentance from sexual sin. It's going to be trumpeted with a fresh emphasis. Uh, but I want to highlight Revelation 2, 19 to 29, because it talks about the spirit of Jezebel and, um, and the judgment that's coming on her and how this spirit is in the church leading the bond servants of the Lord astray so that they commit acts of immorality. Unfortunately, according to the statistics, over 50% of pastors in churches have admitted to using porn regularly. That's one out of every two. Um, and over uh, 60, I believe it's 63 or 67% of Christian men and 17% of Christian women women say that they uh, use use pornography. Um, so that is not okay. We've got to overthrow that spirit and have purity back in the church. Our sexual purity is important. And you need to understand that if you are involved in pornography, you're responsible for children being trafficked. 
You're responsible for the spread of the virus of that industry. So you must stop it. And I know it's not as easy as it sounds, but there's help available. Get whatever you need to stop it. Again, no condemnation, but I'm urgently blowing the trumpet and there will be exposure brought on this and there will be you're going to be surprised actually what gets exposed i might have that down a little bit further but there's some big exposures coming that are going to rattle some but um we are going to um overcome the spirit and it's and have authority over nations as a result also in revelation 18 1 to 20 i want you to read through that but um it says to come out of her speaking of the spirit of babylon uh, my, my people, so that you do not par participate in her sins or receive her judgments. So it, it, it talks about all the ways that this spirit has um, uh, in, entwined itself into the affections of people. And one of the things that is um, uh, uh, outlined, one of the things is uh, uh, slaves and human lives, sex slaves, labor slaves, human souls, the trafficking of souls. And so um, we need to deal with this. And then the final word uh, tonight is regarding the spirit of the fear of the Lord. And um, we're, we've actually been seeing an increase of this over the last year or so, but there's going to be a fresh emphasis on the fear of the Lord and holiness will be carried through this coming year and into the next seven years it's 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 going to grow momentum because it's very much needed and i saw it tying back in with the younger generation where i saw it specifically uh with the younger generation but the older generation in fact if you're a senior i'm telling you these years ahead of you are the best do not downsize do not dwindle in vision you know you are to grow in vision and um in the word, it, it uh, talks about like um, if you like, I think this is Psalm 29:18 or Proverbs 29:18 maybe, and it says um, that without vision people perish. That means prophetic revelation. You are without restraint. In other words you know, you, you just wander, you, you don't know where to go. And if you're especially part of the older generation, I want you to lock in for a glorious future. And I do have a book that might help you. It's called God's Anti-Aging Plan. You can get it on our site or you can get it on Amazon or any book bookstore. But it talks about the the seniors of, of, of God's kingdom taking on new levels of fruitfulness and just going for it because your latter glory is going to be greater than the former. And as older generation, we need to cry out for the younger generation to be visited by a spirit of conviction and a spirit of holiness. And that's for every generation too. But I believe the younger generation is actually going to birth a movement of it. So that's why I want to ask you to pray for that. So many believers, uh, young and old, of course, are going to be visited by a tangible holy presence, kind of like um, Isaiah. In Isaiah 6, he got taken up, he ascended, and we talked about that yesterday, all the ascensions that are going to be happening. He ascended um, into the uh, throne room of God, actually, and there he was met with a conviction that was divine, and it transformed him. And he had a new assignment when he received that, and it's going to happen to many people in these days, um, this uh, spirit of holiness and conviction. And many are going to cry out in desperation for that. And worship songs will be created in the spirit of holiness and the fear of the Lord. And when they are sung, they're going to produce a holy atmosphere in the hearts of those who are singing and in the area of the worship. That's really kind of like that Isaiah 6 experience where he, he gazed upon the Lord and he was in awe and he was like, overtaken because of having that revelation of the Lord himself. And it's, it's, you know, there's lots of songs that we can sing and some of them are about our emotions and how we feel about God and the cry of our hearts and that. But this season there's going to be God's uh, songs that point us to how, how holy he is. Um, 
And in some situations, the holy atmosphere will go beyond the church or the place where the worship's going on and into community. And that's happened in past revivals, like with Mariah Woodworth Etter and um, in all kinds of other revivals, uh, the Welsh revival, um, the presence of the Lord would just went out throughout the community. Uh, Finney's revival, many said that when they went into the, crossed over the county line where he was going to have meetings, they uh, came under the conviction of the Spirit because the presence was so strong. That's going to be happening over the next number of years. A number will be visited personally by the Spirit of the fear of the Lord, so get ready. I'm crying out for that myself. I really want that visitation. I've had two in the past, but I want a fresh one. And extreme encounters, um, such as what we read about in the Bible, will be experienced by uh, some. So... Um, in this, when God's holy presence increases, there's going to be exposure. And what I saw is God drawing his church into greater uh, degrees of uh, exposure of hidden sin. So let's pray for a spirit of repentance, humility, and contrition in those who are exposed. And if there's repentance before exposure, that's the best, right? Get the hearts right and make things right before it has to be exposed. But if it is exposed, I've seen this happen over the last number of years because starting in 2020, January of 2020, there was exposure. In fact, in my book, The Prophetic Manifesto for a New Era, era I wrote that as one of the prophetic words, um, an, an era of great exposure. And it it became public, the exposure on January 1st, 2020, right as we went into that new era. Unfortunately, not everyone who was exposed uh, for their uh, non-repentant sin that had been hurting many people and causing all kinds of, of major issues, legal issues as well, um, that there wasn't the spirit of repentance, humility, and brokenness in those that were exposed. And we need that because we want everyone to turn around and come into right standing with God and be forgiven and cleansed from all unrighteousness. And Ephesians 5, 6 to 16, I'm going to read it to you. It says, let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes on the sons of disobedience. This is the apostle of grace writing this, okay? Therefore, do not be partakers with them, for you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth, trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead even expose them. For it is disgraceful even to speak of the things which are done by them in secret. But all things become visible when they are exposed by the light. For everything that becomes visible is light. For this reason, it says, awake sleeper and arise from the dead and Christ will shine on you. Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. Okay, so I believe that we're going to see the greatest measure of the manifestation of the light of the Lord in this coming season as believers uh, walk in the reality of Isaiah 60. Arise and shine, your light has come. The glory of the Lord has risen upon you. And it talks about nations and kings and coming to the brightness of our rising, that even though there's darkness in the earth, gross darkness, the people, there's something really different for us, the people of God. Okay, and that's who you are. You are one who lives in the light. You are going to have the most amazing year. I'm proclaiming this over your life. So as you're stepping into this new year, you are going to have open heaven. And I just believe that. I believe that that is the nature of the prophetic, that it, 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 it aligns you with God's blessing on your life. And you will be blessed the entire year. It says goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life. So decree that for this coming year. Say goodness and mercy follows me all the days of this year. This coming year is blessed with the bounty of the Lord. Amen. That's you who you are. So um, anyways, I'm, I'm going to uh, make a declaration over you now, and then we'll wrap.
for tonight. But in the name of Jesus Christ, I just declare God's blessing over you. I decree and declare that he crowns this year over your life with bounty in every area of your life, that you will have bountiful anointing, bountiful revelation, bountiful um, divine knowledge and divine intelligence, bountiful power in God, bountiful provision in Jesus' name, bountiful wisdom in Jesus' name. Lord, I thank you that you are empowering your people for this coming year. I can actually feel anointing coming on you now. And I thank you, Lord, that all the intercessors, the watchmen, the evangelists, the revivalists, the pastors, the leaders, the, the, the worshipers, Lord, your lovers, Lord, will be freshly anointed with oil as they step into the head of the year. As they step into this new year, I crown them with bounty. And Lord, for everyone giving tonight, for everyone giving, Lord God, we declare the glory of the Lord over them, a bountiful return on that over the whole year. And it'll be one wave after another coming on them over the whole year with no disturbance of, of, of lack. That'll only be increased for them in this whole year, wave after wave after wave of blessing over their life. In Jesus' name.